morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, giving us some of your time uh, to talk about AWS and backup and DR. Really appreciate it. My name is Moja Mabasar. I'm a um, account manager. I cover Western Canada. And um, so pretty much all of you guys are my customers. But uh, one of the things that um, I do is really I'm a conduit to the grander ecosystem of AWS. So um, any questions you may have about architectures, products, funding, programs, etc., kind of under Gail to help you with that. Uh, we've also got uh, got a couple other people on my team as well. So between the three of us, uh, we cover all of Western Canada. Um, so today we're here to talk about disaster recovery and backup solutions uh, and what AWS offers in that uh, regard. And uh, Michael Haid is one of our solutions architects, and he will be talking about uh, he's be talking about uh, what AWS gets to offer from a backup and DR perspective and kind of talk about really the resilience of our infrastructure. So I'll let Michael talk about that. And then our great partners here at Fuse Forward, they're local partners. Uh, we are really excited that we're running this event with these guys because these guys are so close to Vancouver and really in pro close proximity to uh, all of our customers here. And they're going to talk about in specific about their solution that they built on the AWS um, Backup recovery um, solution. So, without further ado, I'll pass it on to uh, Michael Hay. And uh, thank you very much. Hey, everybody. So, I'm a solutions architect with AWS. So, I work uh, with with the account teams. So, with the account managers, and salespeople, and we're a resource that, that you can can call upon. So, we're in here. <coughs> so the account managers tend to focus on the commercial side of things, the SAs tend to focus on the technical side of things. So if you have questions about services, how do you use a service, I'm having a problem with the service, uh, can you help us with preview, get into preview, just kind of anything around the technical side of things, then we're kind of your, your primary point, point of contact. So the way to engage with us is generally through the account manager. If you don't know who we are, then go through the account manager and you can find us. So in that regard, I was asked to talk about our infrastructure for today. So just, I talked with a, with a few of you beforehand, just to get an idea of how many people are running exclusively like in your own data centers. So either Colo or your own data centers. Well, pretty good. Any, any, are there many people who are exclusively the other side, like in the cloud? Okay, and then the rest of you I gather is some sort of hybrid between, between the two. Okay, just kind of understanding where where people are at. So I was just talking recently with uh, some of my customers who are all in their data center and looking to do migrations. <coughs> so Cloudinger uh, ran this uh, survey in 2018. They went out and they found that 71% of the respondents had experienced a downtime in the last year. And so that was you know, either like a server crash, they had to recover it, um, all the way over to like a ransomware, a malware type attack where you had to do a complete failover to another situation. So as you guys are here and you're aware, it's a very critical part of your, your infrastructure, maintaining your infrastructure, giving continuity back to, back to your businesses. So just, this is gonna be like one of my few marketing slides here, so just bear with me. Because um, most of you are in the US or you're running a hybrid, so you guys are aware of the value of the cloud, right? We're here to help you accelerate the time to market, spin up servers when you need them, spin them down, reduce your cost. <coughs> um, because you're offloading a lot of the management of this infrastructure, we manage the, the infrastructure, the servers, the network. We provide the resiliency around this. So again, right, that removes some of the heavy lifting from your plate, but then it leaves some questions about how does AWS manage this infrastructure. Um, AWS, just a few uh, stats about us. We've been here 13 years, helping millions of customers around the world. We have, currently have 175 service offerings. That was after reInvent 2019, last month. We have 69 availability zones, 22 regions. We've reduced our price 80 times. Just recently, we reduced the price of Cloudinger, which we'll be talking about. The price was reduced 80%. That was just a, a couple weeks ago. And that's just kind of as we go through and 
we get our economies of scale, we're always looking for ways to reduce the cost of our cost structure. And we take that cost savings and pass them back to the customers. So that's the where we get the price reductions. And our S3 object storage has this 11 nines of durability. So if you throw an object in there, it's going to be it's going to be durable. It's still you can depend on being there. And that kind of focus on durability from S3 kind of permeates all that we do. Kind of security is is our top top priority, but then after that it's durability, having resiliency, making sure that your data and your applications are going to be running when, when you need them. <laughs> so talking about our global infrastructure, um, security, as I said, is a top priority. So, oh, just. Uh, security is our top priority, right? So we have people that are running 24 by 7. They're monitoring our, our networks, monitoring our instances just for security violations, um, abnormalities. And if you guys ever suspect that there's a security issue or somebody is doing something suspicious, reach out to them. They, are, they always want to hear about these things and then they can investigate this. Uh, we always work on availability and performance. So we, we want your systems to be up and give you the tools to make sure that your production systems are always running. And then in this case where we're talking about disaster recovery and then sorry, backup situations, we provide tools for that as well. Uh, scalability, flexibility, we provide, you know, like the largest number of services, lots of different EC2 instances. So kind of, if you have a specific need for something, servers, databases, we have a tool that's specific to that, specific to what you want to do. You know, sometimes it can be daunting as well understanding it, so that's as well if you want to reach out to the account team in the SA, we can, we can help. So I'm hoping this isn't new to people here. This is um, our, our regions. So a region is a geographic area where we're operating our data centers. Within a region, we have availability zones. So availability zones are a logical grouping of our data centers. There's one or more data centers in each availability zone. And the availability zones are split out onto different fault planes, different power grids, different cooling systems, so that if one availability zone is affected by something, the other one should not be as well. So kind of from the very, the outset, how we develop our data centers and our presence, we take this re uh, resiliency, high availability performance in each month. Uh, so where did we start? Five years ago, we just had four regions, California, Virginia, Ireland, Singapore, way over there. And then we've expanded over the last uh, 13 years. Uh, right now we have 69 availability zones, 22 regions. We have plans for four more. Those are the red ones. People are doing business in Italy or Spain, our first African presence, and Jakarta, Indonesia. And when we spin those guys up, <coughs> all of the regions take advantage of the same, same architectural patterns, the same hardware, the same software. So all of the regions from that perspective are the same. So we, we run a couple of clouds for the US government, a couple cloud east, there's a couple cloud west as well. And this is being vetted for like top, uh, like uh, top security, high security uh, clearances. So all of that infrastructure, our supply chain is being vetted by like the US government, it's being vetted by international banks. And so that same sort of security and resiliency, assurance of sourcing of our components is rolled out across all our all our regions. So you guys get advantage of, of, of that as well. So it starts from the very base, from the silicon all the way up. So our, our networks, this is kind of one of the things that I find fascinating, is our networks, we always have redundant connections. So even if we're going like the undersea cables, we always have two going across. So that's in the case of if there's a failure somewhere, we have enough bandwidth fail over to, to the redundant connections. <coughs> These are all our own fiber, so it's all kind of like dark fiber. When communications is going from like one region over to another region, it all goes over our backbone, and this is not public. This does not go over the public internet. So all network traffic is all private. So if you have data centers in US West and you want to transfer like a backup through S3 cross-region replication to the east, it will all go over our private networks. Nothing will go out of the public. 
<coughs> so I think that's what we get there. But just a little word on the cables. So these are pictures of our actual cables that we, that we string. Uh, these ones here have like 4,000 strands. So each strand is a 100 gigabit connection. And then we use this dense wavelength division multiplexing. Anybody heard of it before? So, so we take, because we use light, so we take the light and we segment it up into smaller chunks. So you, you know, if you have the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, we do the same thing. And we use each smaller chunk to kind of send data over. So we take the one fiber and through this, we can split it into 160 individual information channels going over. So you take 100 gigabits, multiply by 160 for one fiber, and then these cables tend to have about 4,000 fibers for the new ones of so that's just how we provide like petabits pet pet worth of transfer between our data centers. And the other thing, because we're, we're stringing this, you don't have to worry about it. This one up here, you can see it's blue. This is from uh, Australia. And they had a problem with some insects getting down into these cable bundles, and they would eat and chew through through the wires, through the, the fibers. And so that blue wrapping there has like an anti, as a anti-insect repellent. So it's just, part of the, the things that you guys don't have to worry about. Because we're, we're here to manage that infrastructure. We're there to make sure that it's available when, when you need it. Uh, custom hardware. <coughs> Initially when we started, we were buying commodity um, x86 chips from Intel. But now we're at the point where we are creating our own chips, our own routers, our own Custom, custom silicon. So that goes for our new Graviton chips all the way down to like routers. And our new instances, you might have heard about, um, sorry, my skipping, but our new like R5s and C5s are all based on our, our Nitro system. So we created our own hypervisor and we've created silicon that will kind of integrate with that. So that there's built in security checks between like the hypervisor and the network cards and the routers. And so this is all kind of part of what we're building up now. So this so it provides a higher level of security and it also enhances the, the performance. So these new instances, the R5, C5s, M5s, um, have a 10 to 15% performance improvement over the previous generation. And that's directly attributed to the better hypervisor, the newer hypervisor, and the custom uh, silicon that we're using here. So just talking a bit about the high availability and resiliency. You know, we have our regions. This is kind of like a, a logical representation of the region and the availability zone. So we have the availability zones, which is the logical grouping of data centers. So in, in you know, one case, there, there are one data center. Some cases that can go up to three, four, five data centers. And each AZ is redundantly connected. So if you lose one network connection, we have enough capacity and the other connections to fail over and make sure that the, that the bandwidth is still there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as part of the region, we also have our transit, they're called transit gateways, but they're not the same as that new transit gateway feature. So this is where all of our incoming traffic comes in. So these are our connection points to our, to our trunks. So we have, you know, in the previous picture, we had the redundant fiber connections. We have one coming here, one coming here. So in the case of you losing this, all the traffic would continue to run through this transit situation. And yeah, and I touched on the availability zones right there, each redundant power, redundant uh, cooling, different fault lines. So it's kind of, this is one of the things that I've just kind of heard about is AWS has a commitment to being carbon neutral future and we are engaging with existing power companies to provide you know like carbon neutral uh, power through wind farms solar solar farms but AWS has already also taken the initiative to create their own farms so if you go online you can see Jeff Bezos standing on the top of a wind turbine 
like breaking a bottle of champagne. And so there's we've <coughs> excuse me, we have several solar farms down in uh, East Virginia producing 1,600 megawatts from those from those farms. Uh, and what was I was going to say, and in addition to being this carbon neutral, um, our data centers are also three um, three point six times more efficient than a typical like colo uh, data center that's running. So even though we're not at 100% carbon neutrality, um, by switching over, our, our servers are going to be much more efficient than what is typically done out in the general marketplace. So just kind of, you know, longer term for, for the planet sustainability, we kind of are committed to that and make you guys feel good about it, maybe? You know. So some of the common cloud use cases, which I'm sure you're all aware of, since most of you are running either in AWS or as a hybrid thing, um, cloud bursting. We see people who are running their data centers, their own colo situation. Sometimes you need access to that, so you burst up into AWS. You can share the load between that through either uh, Route 53 or some sort of load balancing, um, yeah, load balancer situation. People often take the application migration, so you have your legacy applications. You need to modernize it. And when you modernize it, you might as well take advantage of some of the cloud services, the cloud flexibility, and cloud agility. And so that's where we see people starting to migrate over as well. And then the one that we're all talking about here is backup and disaster recovery. So people, you know, their data centers, you need to back them up. You need to do a DR failover situation to the cloud. But it also applies if you're in the cloud. Like if you're running in one region, like in the Canada region, for example, and there's like the big ice storm that hits again, and that region does go down. Well, what are you left for? You still need a DR situation. So the same principles that you use for traditional data centers, like the two plus one or n plus one backup copies, also applies to the cloud. You want to have your primary, your second copy to your backup, and then perhaps like an offsite copy, which I would recommend going to a region like on the other side of the world or somewhere, just completely separate from where you. And this is a complicated situation. There's lots of nuances to what can be done. And so companies often don't have either the bandwidth or the in-house expertise, and that's where our partners come in. So Fuse Forward is one of our premium partners. They do a lot of work in this DR space. They also do work with application migrations and kind of these hybrid architectures. So that's what we're handing over here to Ray, I believe. Maybe I'll take you guys through more of this backup and uh, disaster recovery. So, 
let's talk about what's a disaster. So uh, traditionally, we would always think of it as a disaster as a natural disaster. Being that we're in Vancouver, we're on a fault plane. Um, you know, we always have the idea of an earthquake or a tsunami possibly taking us out being in Vancouver. Uh, we also have the the um, uh, fact that you know, if we're in a data center, we also have the risk of uh, having a fire or a flood within the data center. So those are all sort of traditional type of uh, disaster disasters that we look at. But but in today's IT world, um, <coughs> disasters are actually morphing to include ransomware or or um, distributed denial of service attacks, where basically um, your business can be taken down or held for ransom. Uh, also, the security breaches, so, so um, we've, we've all seen um, the hacks that have happened with, uh, like for example, Life Labs or whatnot, where basically they got hacked and they actually um, are a victim of ransomware as well. In addition to that, we, can, we, we also signify a disaster as like a prolonged power outage or network outage. And that you know goes hand in hand with the uh, the fire or flood situation for, for your data center. But majority of you all are all in AWS or have parts in AWS, correct? So just a few stats that we found. Um, uh, basically, we found that, and we didn't take these. We found these stats. The people were uh, found these. So basically, they found that one in three businesses. Uh, don't have a disaster recovery strategy, so um, uh, there's some room for improvement. And again, a disaster recovery plan can, can range all the way from a backup all the way up to a, a complete recovery. So all it takes is a plan, so um, you need to, to look at the plan itself. 50% um, of the, uh, the companies experience downtime longer than a full work day. So basically, uh, it's an outage long enough that basically it's gonna affect your business. So if it's a work day, basically, if it's an application that you really rely on in terms of uh, bringing in revenue, then basically you lost a day of revenue at that point. Well, on the good side of this, 96% uh, of the companies that have a trusted backup for disaster recovery plan were able to survive a ransomware attack. So that's not that grim as we're showing these stats. So let's go over. Um, Two important points that we talked about when we look at a disaster recovery plan as the re recovery point objective and the recovery time objective. So if we look at the middle of this, of this graphic, where basically that's where the, the disaster were to occur. Uh, if we dial back to the recovery point objective, it's actually the, the amount of time that you can actually uh, sustain uh, data loss, for example. And your recovery point objective is actually the point at which you have to actually have a good viable backup. And again, this is something that, uh, it all really revolves around the data. So how much data can you lose and suffer without any detrimental loss? The recovery time objective is actually the actual downtime in which you can actually bring it back up. So this can range, so for example, if you're just doing backup, that recovery time objective would be longer because you actually have to rebuild your, your servers and whatnot versus having much of uh, an automatic solution where and we'll talk about cloud and your where basically it, it spins up new instances and you back within minutes. So any questions up to this point? Okay. So we'll just go over the uh, the on-premise disaster recovery and just, just comparing the two from an on-premise to a cloud perspective. So if you're doing an on-premise uh, back or disaster recovery, you're looking at RPO and RTO in hours and, and days. Whereas if you compare that to cloud, um, you're looking at RPO and RTO in seconds and minutes. And that's basically due to the cloud endure solution, which I'll go over as well later on in this presentation. Another um, thing about the on-premise, there's a, there's a high upfront cost for infrastructure. <clears throat> because of the fact that um, it's on-premise, you're, you're gonna be backing up somewhere or disaster, you're, you're gonna have a remote site somewhere. It's either you own that site somewhere else geographically. So for example, we're in Vancouver, you'd be looking at something on the other side of the continent, Toronto, or even uh, Kelowna or whatnot, somewhere away from the full plane. You either have to own that site or you have to um, uh, partner with a colo or something to be able to do that. So it's very costly. As well, <coughs> if you're looking at the automatic backup, you could have duplicate infrastructure, for example. If you have uh, whatever you're running locally on-prem, basically you're, you're 
your remote side would be a, a duplicate. So you're actually paying a lot, a lot up front. Whereas if we're looking at the cloud, because uh, we can use AWS as the infrastructure, that can be a low upfront infrastructure cost. And the very last uh, comparison would be, uh, it's difficult and expensive to test versus uh, uh, on the cloud, it's easy and affordable to test such that uh, Cloud Endure gives, gives you the, uh, the tools to be able to do that. So let's cover the common disaster recovery challenges. So as, as we, I spoke about, the high cost of duplicate infrastructure. So again, if you're uh, duplicating your, your primary site to your disaster site, you actually have a duplicate set of infrastructure that you're maintaining as well as that site you're, that you're paying for or you're renting from somebody else. Uh, you may have a lack of in-house technical expertise. Um, you may be you know, experts at your application, but when you start looking at a disaster and how, how the disaster occurs, you may not have that in your skill set. You may have to either go outside and get a consultant or, or uh, uh, you have to train yourself to, to, to have that skill. Uh, complicated applications databases. So uh, sometimes you may have some legacy applications that may not be compatible to, to some disaster recovery solutions. So uh, back in the day, there was a lot of proprietary uh, disaster recovery softwares, and, and they were complicated in the fact that they were quite proprietary, and they sometimes uh, relied on uh, having disk arrays that would do uh, replication, hardware-based replication. So if you didn't have an application that actually fell with that compatibility, then basically you'd have to look for some, some other solution to, to, be, to, to help you with your disaster recovery. And now with the new IT, dealing with ransomware and security breaches, um, it's quite a challenge because uh, the older software solutions, you may not have had that security where you can actually dial back to the point where um, the breach happened or the, the ransomware were to occur. You can't actually recover from that, so it's, it can be difficult. And your RTO and RPO may take uh, too long during a disaster event. So uh, we've included a video. I'm just going to play this video, and uh, we'll talk about it right afterwards. The wines are just starting to trickle back in. Shelves of spirits still littered with empty spaces. BC's private liquor stores are, in general, all small mom and pop businesses all around the province. Uh, and they can't afford to not have $50,000 of inventory show up. The backlog in booze deliveries blamed on a cyber attack on Container World in Richmond. One of the BC liquor distribution branch's largest warehouse partners. This had never happened to us before, and uh, you know, uh, it, it certainly took us by surprise. The hackers demanded a ransom. Container World says it couldn't take the risk. We chose to not pay any uh, demand ransoms and uh, to take the appropriate action to protect our systems. That meant a complete shutdown and costly system rebuild which resulted in a dry spell of deliveries that had a ripple effect for restaurants, pubs, and private liquor stores. It's incredibly frustrating from a business perspective, but more the, the human perspective. I mean, these are people's lives. This is how people you know, pay their rents, feed their children. The cyber attack is being investigated, but it's still unknown where the threat was from and why Container World was in its crosshairs. This is the first time I've heard of this kind of attack happening in the liquor industry, but it really shows you how exposed our IT networks are around the world. After nearly a month, Container World says all deliveries should be caught up in the next couple of days. Once this has happened to you, it certainly uh, makes you a little bit more aware of things you need to do within a company to protect yourself. A hard lesson for the BC liquor industry about the dangers lurking somewhere online. John Boyle, Global News. So apologize if anyone's from the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the, the notes that we can take from, from this video is basically it's a classic ransomware attack. Um, and the business was offline for several weeks. Um, they needed to rebuild their IT. And uh, there was a, a large cost of, uh, to, the com to the company as well as to their downstream customers. So what we're talking about today is uh, we have a fully managed disaster recovery solution. Um, so we're with Fuse Forward, and, and with our, our solution, we're using Cloud Endure. So Cloud Endure was, was uh, it is actually uh, a top DR software, and basically AWS purchased them. So they are part of AWS now. And uh, as we'll discuss later, they've actually um, 
reduce the cost for, for cloud in here as well. So our disaster recovery solution, it's a fully managed solution. Um, it's, it's set up, monitored, and tested uh, with our certified AWS engineers. Um, and again, it uses Cloud Endure. Again, it is uh, one of the leading DR, DR softwares available. And uh, AWS has purchased them, I believe, uh, two or three years ago. It's three years? Okay. Why? It was only one year? Okay. And then AWS actually just announced there's an 80% reduction in the price of the AWS software. So um, they're trying to promote their, uh, their DR solution as well. Uh, so it's quite cost effective because uh, when, when AWS, or sorry, when Cloud Endure, uh, the basis of Cloud Endure, it uses low cost staging. So basically you're not actually replicating your, your primary site to the DR site. There's actually uh, a low cost staging area and I'll go over in a later uh, slide regarding this. So it's not a total duplicate of your primary. It's actually quite a bit cheaper. So that's, that's a lower cost. Uh, enterprise grade security. So, in regards to the security, uh, all all um, network traffic is actually, uh, and, and I'll go over this as well, is encrypted, as well as you can encrypt within AWS, in your AWS region. And included in our disaster recovery solution, we have a yearly uh, testing as well. One of the main benefits of Cloud Endure is the uh, wide platform support. So as you see, uh, I think these are the majority, actually this is just some of the logos, isn't it? I think there's, there's more logos actually. So this isn't a total um, support from Cloud Endure, it's actually quite a bit more. But as you can see from the applications, we have uh, you know, major um, ERP, uh, Oracle E-Business Suite, uh, PeopleSoft, we have uh, SAP. Uh, on the Windows side, you have SharePoint, uh, Exchange as well as uh, Dynamics, so uh, a good support for uh, for major applications. If we look at the databases, uh, you know we have three uh, commercial databases that are supported: Oracle, Microsoft SQL, as well as uh, SAP HANA. Uh, it also supports uh, uh, open source uh, MySQL, as well as the uh, NoSQL databases, Cassandra and MongoDB. In regards to the operating systems, as you see, there's there's a wide variety of, uh, of Windows. So basically, Windows all the way up to the newest 2019 and back to uh, 2003. Uh, in terms of Linuxes, we have the commercial distributions like the Red Hats and the uh, the SUSEs, but also the uh, the open source such as CentOS. In regards to the infrastructure supported by Cloud Endure. Uh, shown is the, the physical data center, so if you have an on-prem or a colo, that is supported. And it supports VMware and Hyper-V. But it also supports uh, a backing up or a disaster from a, a different cloud, for example. So it supports Azure, Google Cloud, as well as IBM Cloud and AWS. As well, uh, they also support uh, an AWS run region to region. So for example, if you're running uh, infrastructure in Oregon, for example, you can set up disaster recovery within uh, North Virginia. So basically you're going from coast to coast. So you're, you can protect yourself that way as well. So how does it work? So this is a depiction of Cloud Endure. So if we're looking at the left-hand side, so that's basically like a, your data center or wherever your primary application is running. So basically if you're running an AWS, this could, this could be signified as your AWS region. So you have your instances or, or actual physical servers or even VMs within uh, uh, your data center or colo. Uh, on to the right is actually where Cloud Endure is, is, uh, is deploying the disaster recovery site. So within that target region, there's, there's two areas. There's a, there's a staging area and a target of EPC. So what happens is Cloud Endure, uh, you install an agent within your VMs or physical servers, either on-prem or in your cloud, and they replicate to a staging area. And the staging area is actually using a low-cost uh, Linux machine, and basically it's a replication server. And all it does is it replicates the volumes from your on-prem or your cloud into the staging area. And it does a block 
block replication. And it's a continuous replication. So uh, it'll, it'll reach a point where it's a continuous replication. At that point, uh, it can fail over to the disaster. And what happens is it spins up this target VPC, basically as, as you would if a disaster were to occur. But you don't actually spin that up until the point where a disaster occurs. So basically, uh, when we're talking about cost effective, you're just paying for the staging area, which you're using small Linux servers, as well as uh, not necessarily the SSD for your for your, uh, your staging volumes, but you can use the hard drive or spinning media, so it's a lower cost. So our fully managed disaster recovery solution from Fuse Forward, uh, we'll go over the price of predictability. So, we, so basically there's no upfront fees. Uh, it's a multi-subscription uh, using Cloud Endure. And, and, we, and we have a fee as well. Uh, in terms of security, as I spoke to before, in transit it is uh, AES-256 encrypted, as well as you can, you can uh, encrypt your, your volumes within your, your target, as well as your staging area. In terms of ongoing operations, as I said before, uh, Cloud Endurance is block level data replication. So it'll get to the point where you're actually replicating all your volumes to your staging area, and every time there's a there's a change in your primary region, it will be duplicated into your, your staging area. And there's a one-click fail, fail back to the source server. So if you're in AWS, you can do a one-click and fail back to your, to your primary region. If you're on-prem, basically you just download um, an agent and actually it works backwards where you're actually uh, replicating back to your source site. So uh, it's, it's quite nifty actually. Decreased cost, uh, we talked about the lower cost of ownership and because of the fact that it's a low cost staging environment where you're using uh, small lightweight Linux and you're actually just replicating the volumes and using, uh, rather than SSD, you're using uh, spinning media, which is cheaper than the SSD. Uh, speed to value, Cloud Endure does a, an RPO in seconds. So basically, uh, because of the fact that it's, it's uh, block-based replication, every, every change that's done and your source is actually replicated to your disaster in seconds. And recovery time ejected, it could be within minutes. Basically, spinning up that target environment, basically the, the RTO is very, very low. And decreased risk. Uh, point of time recovery. So Cloud Endure, uh, it takes snapshots that you can actually recover from. And the way they look at their, their, their snapshots, Every snapshot is taken every 10 minutes in the last hour, every hour within the last <coughs> day, and every day within 30, 30 uh, within the month. So basically, you can recover from the last again the last 10 minutes within an hour, any hour within the last day, any day within the month. So basically, if you can determine when the ransomware were, were to occur, you can dial it back to the point before that. So let's review our common um, our recovery challenges. So we talked about uh, high costs of duplicate infrastructure uh, with the Cloud Endure and our and our solution. There is not a, a duplicate infrastructure because of the fact that we're using Cloud Endure and using the staging environment, and the actual infrastructure is not spun up until the point in which you actually need it. So you're actually not paying for that duplicate infrastructure. Lack of in-house technical expertise because of the fact that our solution is fully managed, uh, you can rely on, on Fuse Forward to uh, to do this. So basically, you don't have to have that in-house. Complicated applications and databases, as we've seen from the, um, the supported uh, platforms and applications, Cloud Endure is is quite intensive. So uh, uh, I think we we haven't run into any any databases much. Um, I haven't seen any databases that for applications, but we have a customer that has a, a homegrown application and basically they're, they're doing a disaster recovery within uh, with us as well. So you can check that out. Uh, ransomware security breaches. With Cloud Endure, as I said, uh, with the snapshots being every 10 minutes within the last day and every day within the last month, you have a, a variety of, of points where you can return to. RT, you know, RPO taking too long during a disaster event. Again, Cloud Endure, uh, having RPO within seconds, 
and RTO within minutes. Uh, I think we can check that off as well. So, company you want to talk about Fuse War? Come on up. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ryan. So, Fuse War, uh, we've been uh, managing AWS workloads for about six years. We have clients over in the UK. Um, we have an office in uh, South Africa, and we do have our office here in Vancouver as well, as our head office. So we have over 20 years experience of uh, working as a systems integrator, and we help clients migrate and manage their workloads on AWS. Cool. I didn't, um, in closing, before q and I also wanted to talk to you guys um, about different funding options that we also have as well. So a lot of times our customers are exploring new solutions like maybe a backup and VR solution or it might be a new security solution and uh, want to either engage partners or again explore new um, kind of uh, thoughts for their business. And what we do is um, we want to also be a partner in that and we want to make sure that um, you don't take the whole uh, financial risk. So we do have a variety of uh, funding models that we can actually support in those kinds of initiatives. So whether you're looking today as we're talking about the back of a DR and you want to figure out what that solution would look like and you want to use uh, Fuse Forward for that conversation, we'll be happy to uh, look at any kind of funding option. So I want to put that out there because we want to make sure that our customers are aware of that and uh, take full advantage of that as well. So um, any of your account managers, myself, uh, or the two account managers that cover the West, we'll be happy to have that conversation with you and help you guide you through that uh, kind of journey as well. So just wanted to uh, make sure that you are, you are aware of that. And then with that, I think uh, we will do a uh, We're doing a Q&A. Oh, we're doing a Q&A, okay. We're doing a Q&A So Peace Forward's vision is a world free of complex IT projects. So uh, do we have any questions? Yeah? I have a question about the direct fiber yep. right at the beginning. So, um, so the um, direct connect, is that all direct fiber right across Canada? <coughs> so the direct connect will go from like the, the network hub? Sorry, sorry. So the direct connect will connect your networks into our network. So you go through like the internets or other facilities. And they, we have one of our endpoints, one of our points of presence for our fiber there. So it connects your network into there. But right across to Canada Central, it's all dark fiber. Like it's all. Yeah. So so if you have a direct connect coming into one of our Canadian, uh, like for example, uh, oh, Vancouver, it's CoLogix. Yeah, CoLogix. So if you if you drop uh, fiber into CoLogix, you use their backbone straight into Montreal. And so it's all dark fiber yes. right across. Canada. Basically, it's yeah. it's not like it's all public internet. Basically, it's all. So if you're looking at um, Poipa, or for example, not data sovereignty. You would use that solution because basically your everything stays within Canada. Yeah, and that was yeah. a recent thing, like last year, I believe. The, the, there was a segment around right Thunder Bay that often kind of went down. So, but that was just kind of closed off last year. So now the whole traffic stays within Canada. What yeah. kind of uh, technical knowledge does one need? Does it like a fully user-friendly UI that won't just be? Chooses the websites, chooses the. Uh, so, Cloud Editor? Yeah. So, Cloud Editor will manage that for you. So, we'll work with you and, and we'll get you um, up to speed in terms of installing the agent wherever you have your, you want it, like for your application. So, you have application server, take your servers, the agent would then replicate over to the station area. So, we work with you to get that agent. And then and we'll work with you to set up all the orchestration for the all the servers that you're replicating because those have to spin up when a disaster happens. So we'll work, we'll work with you in terms of how many instances, uh, how much CPU, RAM, the operating system, databases. So we'll set up all that orchestration for you. If your question is, can you do it yourself? You can, um, but it does take some knowledge to do it. And to this point, orchestration, so for example, if you have an application, your database has to come first. Your database has to come up first in the disaster, and then everything else comes it has to be orchestrated in that way. Or if it's an AD, for example, bring up your AD first, and then everything else will come up after that. And we can, we can uh, price out a solution for you. You'll find that the management that we charge is it's very low. So, um, you know, it's 
we have clients that come to us and they, um, they were thinking of migrating their entire application to AWS, and then we showed them a solution where we're just doing the DR, DR solution, and it's a fraction of the cost. So it's, it's a good step if you are running your applications uh, on-prem and you want to do a migration down the road, this is a good uh, step to take in between that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so for the initial setup, um, how much of downtime is required for our primary solution? No, no downtime. Yeah. So when you install the uh, the agent, there's no downtime. Okay. So yeah. The and agent. question in the back there. Yeah. Yeah. On the topic of FOIPA compliant, is Cloudender FOIPA compliant? And what are the recommendations if you're 100% AWS native, you don't have a physical data center, but you have FOIPA compliance requirements? So right now, like you, um, if you're in the Montreal data center and you have FOIPA and you need a DR solution, then you would have to choose another cloud provider, such as Azure or Google Cloud. Um, but you can still use Cloudender software okay. to do the replica, uh, to do the DR solution from the Montreal data center to one of the other public cloud. Until a uh, until we get another region in Canada, that would be your solution. Yeah, you, we don't want. to <laughs> yeah, yeah, so saying, yeah, talk about the Canadian region. You didn't hear from me, but that's not what happened in Canada. <laughs> okay, Mike, I'm going correct me if I'm wrong as well, but we do also have partners like Songart who we can actually replicate to as well. And they have Canadian clouds, right? So it doesn't need to be another public cloud. It could be a partner like Songart that has a presence in Canada as well. And then we can, can replicate our EWS uh, to there as well. So if it's a specific challenges you're facing, happy to talk one-on-one, -on -one. but, uh, but I do know that you don't necessarily need to. Cool. Okay. With the EBS snapshots, is it just like Amazon the EBS currently is that you're paying for the full size of each snapshot for your data storage? Yes. So if you're having one, one every 10 minutes, one every hour, one every day, it can be pretty substantial. Correct. Over the month of snapshots? Yeah, so like if you wanted to be able to go back six months um, in the event of a disaster, you could go back and recover six months ago. It's going to cost more because you have to you store for each snapshot. Yeah, each of those. Yeah. So most people will typically do uh, a week to a month in terms of how far they can go back and recover from. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye